Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new show, The Journey to Fulfilling Relationships. I'm Taylor Tagg. I'd like to first welcome my co-host for the show, Noemi Moreno. Sometimes we struggle in our relationships. They are some of the most important things in our lives, but yet we struggle to be fulfilled in them. The point of our podcast here in this new show is to bring you some of the world's most foremost people and experts on the topic of fulfilling our relationships, whether it be at home or in business or just in life in general. We're going to cover a lot of different topics on relationships. We're going to talk about our personal relationships, our work life relationships, and how we deal with the people who we work with every day. We'll also cover educational topics uh, and, and all the different components of life uh, that help us in our relationships to be more fulfilled and, and, and continuing to move forward uh, in our lives. Fulfillment is the, the promise of something that we are destined to complete, be happier and more alive in our lives through that fulfillment. And so we will talk with so many people uh, around the world who will help us, give us tips, and give us great information about how we can better be fulfilled. So we first begin our topic with probably one, one of the most important uh, issues right now in human relationships, and that is uh, school safety, keeping our kids safe. Are your kids safe at school? We've got a great guest lined up here for you today that will help us identify some of the things that we can do as teachers and administrators and parents to make sure that our kids stay safe at school. It's a really important episode. So I invite your friends, your family, to, to listen to us and to give us great feedback on, on how you feel about our shows and uh, we'll continue to learn and grow. So enjoy the episode. We'll see you soon. My name is Taylor Tagg. I'm a relationship coach, seminar leader, and best-selling author. You can find out more about my work at taylortag.com. And I'd like to welcome my new co-host, Noemi Moreno. Hey, Noemi. Hi. How are you doing? Good to have you. Now, she is an educational consultant, trainer, and coach. You can find Noemi uh, at moreno-taren.com, M-O-R-E-N-O-T-A-R-I-N.com. And now to today's conversation. And our guest today is Suzanne Wolf. Now, Suzanne is a retired educator. She's founder of the Peace Project Peace Initiative and author of Room 23 and the Lockdown Drill. And Suzanne consults with school districts and is a national trainer in classroom management. And Suzanne is joining us today to talk about school safety and planning and how certain relationships in our education system affect the safety of our children. So hi, Suzanne. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Hello, Taylor and Noemi. I'm so delighted to be a guest on your very fabulous and important show. Well, we're glad to have you. And uh, we want to talk about school safety because it's such a hot topic and people are really focusing on it now with the number of school shootings that are going on. But tell us a little bit about you and, and kind of the work that you do in the school system and how you're helping kids today. Well, again, thank you so much for the opportunity. I, um, I'm very passionate about education. It was a privilege uh, to work with kids and their families for over 18 years um, in my career. Um, I loved it so much that even after leaving the classroom, um, after my mom passed away, um, I found that I needed to still have a higher purpose and so I wanted to do two separate things. One was to educate educators, because I think that educators have a daunting job. They have so many decisions they make in the course of the day. They never really leave work behind. They take it with them at night and on weekends. And um, I'm really passionate about helping them to be more effective and balance themselves, more joyful, to understand their purpose of why they're there in the first place with all the things in the way that uh, are so overwhelming for educators that it kind of takes away from that opportunity to really build relationships and community with kids and their families. And so I um, have an Educators Educator website, my, as you mentioned, with Time to Teach, a wonderful program that we are all uh, certified to train in nationally. 
Um, I'm passionate about helping with classroom management, student engagement, um, and also, as you mentioned, this whole safety piece. Um, that's been a huge um, piece of my heart since I uh, started teaching was how do we keep kids safe? And I think, as you touched upon it with relationships, the key is really to establish communities in our classrooms, communities within the school, communities around the school and branched out. And I think it's really important that we humanize everybody in the building. So when I was um, a part of a lockdown drill that really did happen in our district where a high school had a tragedy, um, we found as teachers, we didn't know how to explain to kids why we have lockdown drills. We found that we, uh, you know, you, we all grew up, didn't we, um, doing duck and cover. Um, that was our safety thing was uh, we're going to learn how to handle a duck and cover drill. And in Colorado, it wasn't even really that realistic to, to worry about tornadoes, but we didn't have much else to think about in terms of being safe. And in this day and age, Taylor, as you've mentioned, with all of the school shootings, all of the things that are happening that make our society feel uh, less safe and um, having families more apprehensive to even send their children to school, I think it's really fundamental that we establish some very good relationships within our classroom, the school, and, and outward. And so I did write uh, this book, um, Room 23 and the Lockdown Drill. And I, if I can, I'll just share quickly the story about this. Um, this lovely man on the back here, Guy Grace, was the first responder at this um, tragedy, um, Arapahoe High School. He was the first responder and um, we were in lockdown in my third grade classroom, a few miles away. So we had teachers that had to leave because they had kids at that school. We had to figure out how to cover the classrooms. Kids couldn't leave until each parent picked them up individually. We were thrown into a world of, we have no idea what we're doing. Right. And um, everything seems so scary. And um, I remember getting through that day, making it feel like we were having a party with Miss Wolf. We had snacks, the kids laid on the floor. I read them books and I was just putting it in the back of my mind that something horrible was going on, but I owed it to these kids to help them feel reassured and safe. And so um, I remember when the last kid left, uh, getting in my car and um, calling my mom and just losing it because I knew something horrible had happened and I had had to hold on to that being normal for kids. And as I thought about the next day, how do I help kids feel safe? I realized that we should write thank you notes to these people. And I already encourage, if you want to talk about relationship, let's thank some of these first responders um, who have to do the unthinkable by being at a scene and seeing blood and, and, and seeing a loss of life in a frantic, chaotic situation. Let's honor them and know that they're being impacted as human beings as well. Their families are going to be impacted by um, them experiencing this. Um, there's a whole thing on vicarious trauma we need to pay attention to that families, entire families are impacted uh, when a first responder has to um, confront something like this. And so I decided to have my kids write thank you notes to these people in the security department. And I told the kids, you know, some of you may know that something difficult happened yesterday. We're not really gonna talk about that. You know, third graders like to talk about everything. I said, but I want you to know there's somebody that wakes up every day to keep us safe. Every day he gets up and his name is our buddy Guy Grace who keeps us safe. And every day he and his friends get up and we can't see them out there, but they are there and they're keeping us safe. And I want us to write thank you notes to them so that they can know who they're keeping safe. Because I think when you have a district of thousands of kids, it's hard for them to know that they should be meeting, um, you know, Johnny or Katie or Susie or whoever it is, who are these kids? And so I had the kids write the thank you notes. Dear our buddy guy Grace who keeps us safe, comma, and I, I should have written that part for them because eight-year-olds take 10 minutes just to do that. But then it was, you know, my name is Katie. I'm eight years old. I have a dog. I love math. My favorite color is purple. Do you like ice cream? You know, and just these lovely um, tender letters from kids. Thank you for keeping us safe. 
and I had them decorate them. And then I collected some goodies from the staff to make a basket to say thank you to them. And I brought it the next day. I walked in on a situation that seemed very, like the worst moment I could have ever entered. It was very somber. I was all excited. I had my thank you notes, my goodie basket. And I walked in and I sensed something very wrong. And I just said, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I'm Suzanne Wool from Centennial. Thank you so much for keeping us safe. And I left and I kicked myself the whole way out. I thought, how dare you, how inappropriate, you've intruded. And Guy Gray sent me the most magnificent thank you note that they had just reviewed the crime scene footage. And they were also devastated to see exactly what had happened, um, how close they were and, um, you know, in terms of everything happening um, so quickly. And they didn't know how to get out of that moment. They were all stunned. They were all ready to just say, we can't keep doing this. They had lost their way. They were ready to quit, but they got our thank you notes and they stood in a circle and they read each one and they passed them around and read each one of those notes. And that helped get them back on track to remember their purpose of who they were keeping safe. And so we invited him to come and read to the kids. And uh, his first time, he was very nervous, a bit emotional, but he got to introduce himself as Guy Grace, who's married with kids and a dog. And the kids instantly glommed on to this human being. Uh, and so when we had to do lockdown, they would be able to say, oh, our buddy Guy Grace, we know him and he knows us. And, and now we feel more reassured. And so in my very verbose way of explaining this, one of the things I really want to do with my book, besides reassure kids on how to be safe, it's to have people come in and read to them. Whether it's the lunchroom lady, uh, whether it's the custodian, the secretaries, the paraprofessionals, all of them getting to say, I'm Miss Holly, I'm a grandmother, I have a cat and a dog, and I serve you lunch, and I'm here to keep you safe. And I think if we can get more people in the building to be more humanized as people first that have a job in our building, but are also there to keep us safe, I think there's a lot of power to that. And so um, there's nothing greater than having um, a book read to you. And that's what Guy Grace did. And that sort of started me thinking, this is one way to develop those relationships so that people are invested in each other. Um, Guy Grace can know those faces and say, these are the kids I'm keeping safe. And I even want, am working on extending this to the police departments around the nation. I uh, woke up at 2.30 in the morning, my, my poor fiance, uh, and I said, I've got it, I've got it, it's Oasis, Oasis. And he said, what? And I said, Oasis, Operation Activate Safety in Schools. A school should be like an oasis. I've got it, I'm so delighted, I had to wake you up. And uh, when I asked him in the morning if he remembered it, I, I think he should have lied because he said no, but um, <laughs> it was okay. Um, my point is I want, for, I want police officers to take a school on their beat and adopt that school one coffee break a week and intentionally go and visit kids. It doesn't cost a thing. It doesn't have to be the same day, the same time. It's just one time a week to say, I'm Officer Harrison, and I am the police officer that protects your school, and I have a wife and a son, and I coach football, and I'm here to keep you safe. And then they can read, or they can play at recess or have lunch with these kids. And these kids then can see that not all cops are bad, and that we can maybe start healing some of the dialogue in our society about cops are bad or, or all the things that are wrong and just be more proactive, less judgmental about the people out there that are really um, working to keep us safe. And I figured it doesn't cost anything to do that. Right, so free. I work with a lot of police chiefs um, throughout the nation through LinkedIn to see if they'll adopt this program because it's free and easy. So that's one of the many things. 
Well, that I, I know, have, know um, that your 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 book is called Room Twenty Three and the Lockdown Drill, and I want yes. to talk a little bit about the, the book yeah. itself um, and mainly, you know, the, the teacher, the, the the relationship between teacher and student, because what you were describing is building trust uh, in the school, in the community, and so I know that's very important to the success of your work. That's absolutely fundamental. You know, we're not here to teach kids how to be learners. We're, we're here to teach them how to be the best human beings they can be first. If you can help a student feel safe, loved, and enough in the classroom, they're going to learn. But if all you're focused on is this rigorous, we have to do these standards and we have to be doing this at 11 o'clock and, and to not have the flexibility to cultivate community in the classroom, empathy in the classroom, um, safety in the classroom, uh, you're not going to be effective. And so for me, um, it's, it's more of a journey with kids. It's not a year with kids, it's a journey. And that's been a real privilege to still be very much in touch with um, so many of my students from even 18 years ago. So this book was written because my classroom was room 23. And um, we wanted to do it from the point of view of a third grade classroom starting the day and just all of a sudden, um, a lockdown announcement comes on and kids are banging into each other. They're confused and lost and, uh, you know, it's a little chaotic. It shows lockdown and, um, and then the teacher just uh, helps get them in the corner. She uh, covers the door and then kind of just reassures them of the steps that are going to happen along the way. You know, one of the things that happened in lockdown for us, and that does happen, is the principal makes sure the door is locked. That's terrifying when you're in the corner and you hear the door, you know, rattling. And so I wanted to make sure kids knew that that's one of the things that's going to happen. And that's part of the routine, that we're safe. They're just checking to make sure the door is locked. Um, we talk about all the scenarios of... Um, where you might be. Not all kids are in the classroom when a lockdown announcement comes on. Right. And so we need to empower kids to know you are already safe in so many ways. Here are all the ways that you're already safe. The, the nice officer comes and visits and compliments them on all the things they do right. And then talks about a few things that they still need to know. What if you're in the bathroom? If you're in the bathroom uh, and your classroom door is going to be locked, you need to crouch on top of the toilet. Well, those aren't things that teachers know to tell kids. And we wrote this book according to the guidelines of, um, of NASRO, which is uh, National Association of Student Resource Officers. And so we wanted to make sure that kids knew that they need to um, crouch on top of the toilet seat. Um, we needed kids to know that if they're in the hallway, they go into the first room and lock the door, even if a teacher's not there, that they have permission to do that. Um, we talked about if um, somebody comes late and they might get pulled into another classroom. Well, kids are usually like, you're not my teacher. I can't go with you. Yes, in this case, you do. You get in the first classroom and you get to be safe. And if you're locked out of all the rooms, you have to run outside and hide. And again, that you don't do that for anything else, but that you do that, for example, here, you hide, um, and that is the safest thing, is to get out of the building if you have no other place to hide. And one of the other things that's really huge about this book is talking about this right here, which is what if there's a fire alarm? And you know, we're so wired to think we have to get out of the building if there's a fire. But the truth is, is that you might have somebody with very, very evil intentions that pulls the alarm to get kids out of the classroom. And I believe that's what's just happened recently. Yeah. It breaks my heart. And so what we have here is that the lockdown drills uh, rules apply first. You smell for smoke, you see if there's fire. If you have no indication of fire, you stay put. And these are things as an educator, I didn't know to tell my kids. And so this book is really important because we want to give teachers a tool to read this book and think, well, what did Ms. Kinehart's class do? And, um, and that way uh, they can feel empowered to say, we already are safe. We're not trying to panic you. We want you to just have an action plan in case this ever happens. But the way we frame it is, how many fires have you ever had in your building? Well, let's see, 50 years, we've never had any, but don't you practice every month? We do. 
Well, just like a fire drill, you practice this all the time. It may never happen, but it's just important to have that plan. So that's really the passion behind this book is just to empower kids. It's to empower parents to know what's happening with their kids during a lockdown. I, I know parents get frantic when they get that phone call. What's happening with my child? How is the school taking care of them? And so this is just, since it is so new, we have educators that don't have any idea how to explain why we do lockdowns. And so we were very intentional to think of everything we could to make it reassuring for kids. And, and, I, and I want to touch again uh, for the sake of our teachers and administrators as well who have a responsibility in the school to protect, protect children and it's one of the most vulnerable places. Yes. So what are a couple of things that they need to be uh, a little more aware of and, and can help calm the situation when a lockdown drill uh, comes, comes about? That's a, you know, that's exactly right, Taylor. It's a great question. We need to really be proactive here. You know, it's not about talking about whether we should have guns or no guns. That's, it's, it's not the issue. It's about empowering kids to have an action plan in every scenario, actually taking the steps to practice with kids. Uh, we wrote lesson plans with this book so that kids know age appropriately, what's the best term um, for uh, lockdown or stranger or whatnot. Um, we have it from kindergarten to sixth grade uh, to make sure that they're cognitively, uh, you know, able to follow these directions. We have lesson plans for kids with special needs. Um, and so you need to practice these things. You need to be able to have that scenario to act it out and for kids to feel like I've got this. And so for special needs, I've started um, a fundraiser I call them safety soothing sacks. And it's because you have kids that might be on the spectrum that get triggered just by the alarm and that they get panicked and triggered. The noise is too much and they can't look at the adults and know the next steps um, without having a frantic energy. And so I wanna create again proactively these sacks where I have stuffed animals and uh, maybe some earbuds or something, a stress ball, and these kids can know at the beginning of the year, I'm gonna grab my safety soothing sack as soon as the alarm goes off and take what I need to feel calmer so I can pay attention to the adults in the building. We don't consider that, and that's a very important population that we need to keep safe. And I think um, just something that simple might help to um, make sure that we've got their attention to help direct them as well. Wonderful. And then, and then uh, just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, your, your focus as a, a consultant in, in helping uh, situations in the, in the school system, you know, be safe. You know, what are a couple of the other really important points that, that come from the book and then also come from your work as a consultant? Well, I'll tell you a few things because I've really researched this uh, you know, uh, I wanted to be thorough. I wanted to make sure they were national guidelines. Um, I've attended a Red Cross um, active shooter training. And I'll tell you one thing that um, really was a compelling story at the active shooter training in, um, for the Red Cross is there was a woman that worked for Homeland Security, a very bright woman. This is her wheelhouse. That's what she did. She said she went to a school simulation where a lockdown, an active shooter event was being simulated. And they were locked in the room, you know, you feel a little frantic and uh, somebody knocked on the door and said, open up, it's the police. And she was so relieved. She jumped up, thank God the police are here. She opened the door and they said, that was the last thing you should have done. And thinking this very intelligent woman who actually is involved in this field felt very, very stupid, but I could see where any of us might feel relieved to let the police in, except you never let anybody into the room and that's something that we put um, on this page is that our security officer has the keys to every room in the building and so I'll go speak to kids I'll read part of the book and we'll go through what if you're in the bathroom what if what if someone knocks on the door I'll go knock on the door and I'll say what if they say it's your mom can you open the door no but it's your mom no we can't that's exactly right because even if mom's there, we don't know if somebody's there with her. So that's exactly right. That's the one time you can say no to mom, don't say no to mom any other time. 
but that really we have to emphasize you do not open the door to anyone. Uh, that's a very huge piece. I also have the opportunity, and I want to um, show this book as well. Um, Eric Combs is a director with Time to Teach. He um, has a great program on um, student engagement and motivation, which we took. And I'll tell you, I learned an awful lot. I'm also trained in that. But he has a new program about safety and security habits for educators. And Eric and I are beginning to collaborate on um, this because he has a lot of expertise in, um, you know, he's former military. Um, he's very well versed in, um, in tactical operations and, um, and helping train other armies, uh, Air Force um, soldiers in, um, in tactical awareness and safety. And so his passion now is to help educate the adults in the building on protocol you need to have for um, if you have to set up a control center, um, what are the steps you take for evacuation and stopping the bleed. And, and so he's got this program that is designed to educate the adults in the building. And we thought it dovetailed really nicely to have my program that's really um, geared toward kids because we have to keep everybody in the building safe. We have to empower all of them. And so he and I are going to start to try and get into schools. Um, my part would be educating um, teachers, kids, parents, community members, volunteers, substitute teachers. Anybody that's in that building has got to know what the plan is. And his is more on the, the expertise of, of how to manage this on a higher level to keep, um, you know, how to get the adults involved in becoming the person um, assigned to whatever process to keep people safe. So I'm very excited to collaborate with him um, on this. That's beautiful. Now, how, how, can we, how can we find you online? If, if teachers want to know more about oh. your book and, and, and buy your book, how can we find you? Oh, well, thank you. I've got two different um, ways to find me. Uh, one is through um, the educatorseducator.com. And uh, that is my whole website on educating teachers on their own balance in their lives, mindfulness on classroom management with structure and empathy, my time to teach trainings, uh, student engagement and motivation, that ability to train teachers and for them to be able to receive credit for that because I am accredited, so that can help with their licensure, but also just to help in terms of how we need to have a system-wide approach to managing the classroom so we have less disruptions. And so that would be my time to teach um, training and speaking, educatorseducator.com. And my nonprofit is called projectpeaceprogram.net, projectpeaceprogram.net. And Project Peace stands for, peace is the acronym, promoting empowerment, awareness, community, and empathy. And I came up with that as my heartfelt nonprofit cause because I really want to work with the underserviced populations that really don't have enough resources in education. Uh, the high risk kids, special needs kids, um, the uh, you know management of the classroom and the motivation um, and the safety and security, all of those pieces need to come together for us to uh, be more effective. And so that's, um, that's my other, um, Passion is my new nonprofit, uh, so that I'm kind of pulling it all together. So those are the two ways you could get a hold of me. I was just thinking about the community and the parents, like the parents who actually had their children survive, um, you know, incidents that are survivors and um, have to help their their child and their neighbors and even those that are closest to them um cope with the the you know with what just happened because at douglas high school um anthony praised jesus he survived he survived the shooting and now um he's afraid to go back to school mm -hmm. and um and even the kids that you know the, the way they handled everything is beautifully done um, and, and they've worked really hard to, to make the adjustments that they needed for the students and for the parents. But what, what else can we suggest 
for the community to help them cope with all of this and, and what you know, Noemi, come out with. <laughs> you bring up a very critical point that I didn't know about until we experienced this together as a school district. Um, there's this whole concept called vicarious trauma and it really matters and we need to think about it. We don't have many resources for um, school resource officers. You know, the police departments have something in place when a police officer is a first responder, but the school systems are really lacking in their resources to help the first responders and their families because they're bringing home this pain. The teachers of the students and the, you know, staff in the school, all impacted by this. And we don't remember that we, that we have this issue, that you have to come back and you're still in pain. Like I had to compartmentalize just even being in a lockdown event and to have to, you know, talk about that, have some support for that. We need to have a way to heal. You know, I was thinking that it'd be lovely to have like a healing place, a place to go in the school. That's like the safe place people could go, the kids could go or adults could go and to get some kind of nurturing, some kind of healing. Maybe it's something that's decorated by the kids or the families so that they can take ownership of what it would feel like to create a safe place within a place that wasn't safe for a period of time. And how do we reestablish that? And I think we really do need to start a dialogue about the funding that's going on in schools. Colorado just funded millions of dollars um, for safety and security and they're not sure how to allot that money. Well, part of it needs to go to trainings to empower everyone, but it also needs to go to the piece of counseling that helps people heal. First responders at Arapaho are still traumatized to this day about that. And so um, you don't forget trauma. You just learn how to manage it better and we all need more tools to do that. Yeah, I think the mental, the mental health piece is the one piece where we're, we're still learning and growing and there's still so much expansion. Uh, you know, trauma is something that's, well, it's difficult to overcome, to be honest with you. And so we need, we do need ways to pull together as a community to be able to comfort each other and, and, get, and get some real help too, because, you know, it, it is a process to be able to, to deal with it and work through it and then uh, maybe even give it new meaning in our life and, and, and work through it and, and keep going, so to speak, with, with uh, our lives. You know, Taylor, I think um, what I've learned from, you know, losing my mom and thinking, you know, there can't be any blessing in having the greatest loss of your life, except it really led me to leaving the classroom, which was hard to do, but to try and make an impact on a greater level by honoring her. I think silver linings it's never okay to have these tragedies but how we can come together and we see how um, the latest community has come together to lobby for change um, I think those are the things that unfortunately have to take place and if we can hold on to the positive of it to see how we are coming together how we are trying to have solutions now you know that's all we can ask for is that we have some outcome that helps us heal, that helps us have stronger relationships, more trust in each other, more empathy. And so um, if we can get on the right path because of it, um, you never wish for it to happen, but this is the best outcome we can have. Right. And there's another, there's one more aspect to this, you know, we want to cover and that that's the aspect and relationship of the parents with the school as well. It's, yes. it's critical, you know, that parents, get in a panic when they hear about school shootings or yes. concern for the safety of their kids at school and uh, what what can parents uh, do and focus on that might help them with the situation well I think just like anything else it's educating them um, you know I think the first step and that's why the educators educator sort of came to me as another epiphany um, is we have to educate parents on what we're doing with their kids the problem is we have to step back a little bit and educate the educators on how to do it first. I mean, there really isn't a book uh, and that's not um, grandstanding. I, I was telling Noemi, I actually was apprehensive about promoting my book because I didn't want anyone to think I was capitalizing on a tragedy. So even though I've got this book and I'm passionate about it making a difference, I've been keeping it 
a bit under wraps, but I think that if we can help educators feel confident in what they're doing with the kids, then the next step is to bring parents in and have them read the book to them, have them go through the drill so they can see where would your kids evacuate to if, you know, away from the building, there is a plan in place and we need to help parents know where uh, in their particular school they would go to meet their kids or where their kids would be in all these different scenarios so that they can have peace of mind that, you know, if we have a plan, we're empowered. If we just kind of think nothing's going to happen, that's where chaos happens. And so it's, I would love to have an opportunity to speak to parents and educate them uh, because I think that's critical. They're entrusting us with their children's lives and uh, we, we owe them, you know, uh, the ability to, to keep their kids safe and to help them understand how we're doing so. Yeah, and I, and I think too that it's, it's, it's so critical and there will be people, uh, listeners to this program here that, that may not have uh, children in schools, but now they're aware and concerned uh, community-wise about what's happening in the schools. So do you have a couple of tips that we can, we can share with some of our listening audience that may be on the outside looking in, but that's now really concerned about uh, just school safety in general, because it seems to be just one of the most vulnerable places uh, of, in our lives, really. You know, Taylor, I think like anything, um, for example, when I was at that active, active shooter training for Red Cross, and we were in this ballroom at a hotel, and one of the speakers said, how many of you um, looked around already and saw where the exits were? And apparently there were a whole bunch of law enforcement officials there raising their hand, and then there was me going, oh my gosh. I, well, that's exactly right. We don't gear ourselves in any situation to think, if something would happen, not that I'm going to live my life in fear, not that I'm not going to leave my house, but if something were to happen in this moment with me sitting in this ballroom, where would I go? What would I do? And it's the first gear we all need to start to have, whether we're in a movie theater, whether we're at an outdoor concert, it's to just for a moment, whether we're in a grocery store, for that moment, look around and have that awareness and have a plan and then let go let go and live your life. But to start by having that gear is the most important thing. Community members can pay attention to people walking around the schools that don't seem like they belong. We need to have more investment in, I'm going to call 911. It's not gonna hurt me to call 911. This person doesn't seem to be long in this situation. For all of us to become more aware um, of each other and to have the desire to keep each other safe is what's going to strengthen our communities. Lovely. Now, Amy, you have any other questions for our lovely Suzanne? No, it's just been a privilege to listen to you. Thank you. I admire you both so much for, for featuring this and, and getting the conversation started. We all can become more educated and empowered and um, just make each other better by these kinds of communications and relationships. So I, I'm intensely grateful to both of you for this opportunity. Well, wonderful. And the last, and the last question, which it's, it's, uh, we ask this of all of our, our guests, you know, what is it that really the dri that drives your heart uh, to help kids and school safety and, and that's just at the heart of your work? What is that, Suzanne? You know, Taylor, um, I'd say my defining words are clarity and authenticity. The things that, for me, having worked in some of the poorest of the poor schools in Denver, inner city Denver, 99% free and reduced lunch, to see kids that have parents as gang members, moms or dads in jail, um, realizing that they can't help their circumstances, but we can certainly do whatever we can to help them not be a product of their story, um, to, to really give them what they need to be successful. Um, and so I just have such a deep felt passion about that because I think we all as human beings, first and foremost, deserve the opportunity to thrive. And so this is what really drives me. Um, keeping kids safe is first and foremost in my mind so then we can help them to become productive and successful human beings. So. It's got to be that they're safe first, and then we'll have the opportunity to 
manage them with uh, empathy and love and structure and to give them the engagement and motivation they need. And uh, to be a teacher is honestly the greatest privilege I know. And uh, we all need to be more invested in um, the future of uh, our society. So wonderful. And thank you for joining us, Suzanne. It's been wonderful. And Noemi, thank you for being the co-host and, and getting on the program and going for it. And so we, again, thanks Suzanne for joining us here. And again, thank you're listening. Thank you both so you're, much and best wishes to you. Well, best wishes to you too. We'll see you next time for our next amazing success story. Bye for now.